morning everyone and welcome to this episode of our mini-series Getting to Better Together, which is sponsored by the Centre for International Development, Social Entrepreneurship and Leadership at the University of the Sunshine Coast. And I'm your host, Richard Borden. Before proceeding, I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respects to elders, past, present and future emergent. Actually, it's the general theme of future emergence that we're going to explore as our theme today in conversation with a long-standing friend and colleague of mine, Oliver Freeman. Good morning, Oliver. Good morning, Richard. Oliver is one of Australia's pre-eminent futurists and scenario planning scholar practitioners, the details of which occupations and professions, perhaps I should say vocations, I'll leave for him to explain in just a moment. Oliver, there's much talk these days of the need for futures thinking as a competency or for developing foresight or scenario planning for strategic transformation of organisations, institutions, societies, communities, even individuals. And all these are set within a context of what we might call learning from the future. As one who's been professionally engaged with such matters over more than three decades, what's your take on these calls? Let's start with the question, what does a futurist actually do? Well, it's a good question. The, the futurist normally, it, as far as the receiver of his or her services is concerned, wants uh, the futurist to predict what's going to happen. And that's absolutely not what futurists are here to do. Uh, futurists actually are here to, to provide a framework in which we can anticipate what might happen, but not to sort of buy into probability that it's more likely to be this world than that. And you may remember from work we've done in the past where we've had clients who actually only want us to provide a predictive framework for their organisation, when in fact all, what we want to do is to find a future-oriented context in which they can learn about the way in which strategic planning should or could be made for their organisation in the context of the future. I always love that expression um, that we both use regularly that says that scenario planning is not about trying to get the future right, but to avoid getting it wrong. Yes, that's absolutely right. I mean, that, that encompasses what I've just said, and it, it is significant. Um, let me just, as a context, think about where we are today, because it's relevant to this conversation. Here we are in the year 2021, and we are in the middle of an environmental sort of headache, which is COVID-19. And the pandemic, which has been with us now for a couple of years, was foreseeable. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And in fact, we, I can go back and look at work we've done in the past when we've indicated the possibility of futures in which pandemics operate. But what's interesting in, in what, where we are now is that in scenario speak, the pandemic is no longer a critical uncertainty. That is, it's not something that might happen. It's actually here. So we are now in a situation in, again, using scenario sort of terminology, where we have a predetermined element in the environment which is impacting us, which is COVID-19. Now, the uncertainty which relates to COVID-19 is actually not about the, whether or not we have a pandemic, but is actually how it's going to play out. And if you think of what's happening in India today, even a month ago, that didn't seem to be a likely uh, outcome, uh, but it's now with us and it's, it's transforming the way in which organisations operate, countries and whatever, uh, in, in view of uh, the, the, the pandemic itself. I just got a hint of that this morning. Nastra and I came up in the lift up to the studio here and two other people stood outside. And it's quite a big lift. And they said, um, well, we can't come in because you two are already in there. And it's certainly in terms of, of movement, distance between us, certainly more than 1.5 metres. And I thought as we came up, we actually said, yes, please come in. And they stood absolutely pinned in the, in the two corners. And we sort of stood there thinking, isn't this amazing, you know, that... Uh, the two years ago to which you refer, we would have had a, a lift jammed with people all chatting away. Now here we were, four sullen people in four sullen corners. Now the bad news about what, where we are today is that the 
uh, changes in the external environment that we are coping with, the COVID-19 changes in particular, but there are others, of course. Uh, as an aside, I was talking to my son in London this morning, and it's been raining in London for the last three days, non-stop. Do you know it's been raining in Sydney for the last three days, non-stop as well? So uh, you have another sort of uh, possibility emerging to do with water and floods and whatever. But the important point is this that because the pandemic is with us, this isn't, it isn't irony. This is not the best time to be doing scenario planning. You want, to, you want to do scenario planning when the world is good. When you're in a situation where it feels like business as usual, you know, we're going to bowl along happily, sort of being profitable and productive and happy and whatever. That's the time you need to do the planning because that's the time when you're about to get your bum smacked with a, a big whack because something suddenly comes in and, di and changes the whole environment. So in terms of going back to the scenario speak, the critical uncertainties are the issue and they are most evident in situations of relative calm. As you say, that's sort of paradoxical, isn't it? And it's been our experience of uh, with people who said, well, we don't need scenario planning because we know where we're going. Yes. And as you and I have found out, in, you know, working, I was thinking today, we've been working together for 30 years now. And we look back, and if you look back at our clients over the years, and we've, they've been a number of significant uh, organisations, particularly government-based ones. And throughout, there is a welcoming of the process and of engagement but a complete failure to understand what to do with the, the outcome in terms, of, in terms of strategic planning, you know, specifically. Well, I think one of the major insights that came uh, from us working together was the issue that we are constrained by the beliefs and assumptions that we have about such things as the nature of reality and the nature of knowledge and the set of values that we hold to. Uh, so it's a bit like the confirmation bias, isn't it? Or the biases in psychology generally, where even though we know that what we're holding to is either not sustainable or is wrong morally or morally questionable, we still continue to do it. Yes. And the, the thing that interests me in what you just said is the whole concept of sustainability is actually a value based concept. Uh, and what, one of the frustrations when you get into conversations on sustainability is the failure for people to see that the world view that uh, says we should behave like this rather than like that is not self-evident. It's actually a position that people take on a value basis and people will, will have different values in, in approaching that particular issue. So sustainability, you know, is not, for me, is not a factual kind of uh, process. It's to do with the way we want to live our lives and the way we want to treat each other. Yes, I've quoted before on this, uh, in this mini-series a um, philosopher friend of mine in Tasmania who said that sustainability as a contestable issue is its strength because it leads to precisely what you've just said. Uh, the way he read it, said it was an agenda of good questions about how we should live our lives. So, yeah, we're coming Oliver, tell me a little bit more about uh, the actual process of scenario planning, how you start, how you proceed and so on. Well, as you know, Richard, over the years we've developed, we, we started off uh, very much with the what was called the Shell School of Scenario Planning, developed by uh, Royal Dutch Shell uh, in the 70s and 80s. And we sort of came along and got involved with a group called Global Business Network, GBN, based in San Francisco. And we, well, I certainly learned scenario planning from them. But we've take, we have taken their framework and we've sort of developed it, I think, in, in some interesting ways. And we now have a five-step process. Um, it very quickly, the process starts off with asking questions. What is, what is it, we in, in terms of what you were saying earlier, what is it we want to learn from the future? You know, what is it about the future that is important for our organisation, what, what or whoever we are, uh, that we want to focus on? We then have an interesting step that we've introduced into the process, which is basically to say to our clients, what is your preferred future? What is the future you would welcome? Now, this is not the same as a scenario. This is actually a value-based uh, 
description of an ideal world for us. And we like to map that with our clients so that they have a strong sense of where they would like to head if all things were equal, which of course they're not. We then move away from their concerns to look at the external environment and to figure out what are the key, what are often called drivers, and we like to say influences, what are the key influences shaping the environment in which that question will be asked and in which we may or may not be able to move forward to a preferred future. And out of all of that, those three steps, we then build scenarios. We have been, as you know, we, we, you and I have a slight difference of agreement on the scenario process in the sense that I tend to use the shell matrix approach as a starting point. You prefer something a little muddier and a bit more difficult to deal with, but which essentially is more creative. I mean, what, uh, I, I have, in terms of my sense of humor you were talking about, I have this thing about, you know, people talk about the important thing uh, in strategic thinking is to think outside the box. You know, that's a, that's a well-worn phrase. And I'm saying to myself, well, the trouble is that most of the work we do on scenario development is thinking inside the box. If you think of a matrix, it is actually a box. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a series of boxes. And all the thinking we're doing is inside the box, not outside. Anyway, I, you then get into the known unknowns and the unknown knowns and all of that sort of stuff and everything. Life becomes incredibly complicated. But anyway, I'm just saying that, we, you know, we do want uh, to create a set of scenarios which are anticipating alternative futures. Uh, and those futures, we tend to, we, we like to see a utopian future. We like to see a dystopic one. We like to see a business as usual one. And we like to see something which is sort of organically progressive, but not a highly disruptive kind of future. But that, that's just, you know, those things sort of fall out accidentally. And then once we've got the scenarios in place, we say, well, given these alternative futures, what the hell do we do about it? What, going back to the framing question, um, interest in having a look at the future environment in the way it may impact on us, what should we be doing? And I think the critical step here, which I emphasize all, all the time, is that we are not talking about predicting how we might behave in the, at a future point in time. The point here is that for scenarios to go forward, we like to go forward for anything from 10 to 30 years, depending on the, the topic area. And we don't want us to get into a situation where we're sitting around a table thinking about the strategic steps we might take in, in say, 2050. What we're actually interested in, what we're really interested in, is what the hell do we do today? So that is, bring it back. You have to bring it all back to the, the present because we want to give our clients some kind of framework which would impact on their current strategic thinking and planning uh, and not just uh, a view of, of going down the track. You've written fairly extensively on the outcome of uh, a whole series of projects that um, you, I, and uh, you with others have been conducting, and you've written two particularly powerful books, in my opinion, with um, uh, Richard Watson, who's another friend and colleague of yours. What direction uh, are those books trying to take us, trying to take the reader? What are you saying to the readers? I think what we're trying to do is to make the process of strategic thinking to make it friendly and accessible. And, and, and we, we try and do that by uh, focusing on the storytelling aspect of scenario planning. So it's interesting, if you look at the way in our book, which is called Future Vision, the way we've organised it, we started off with the narratives that related to the alternative futures that we had put together uh, for the book. And we then, so that's the first half of the book. Then the second half of the book deals with what we've just been talking about, which is the process. And the reason for doing that is that I want to engage people. I want them to get hooked to the imaginative content of future worlds before they get stuck with the, you know, the, the intellectual and methodological stuff. Minutiae, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
So that, that as a strategy, that was the first thing that we did. The second thing we did was we, we know that in order to write a book that's going to be of general interest, we needed to focus on a framing question of thinking of the process, which was relevant to most people to some extent. Um, so we weren't, for instance, trying to build scenarios for the future of shoe manufacture in um, Mozambique. I mean, you know, that I'm being silly, but that's, that's a very precise sort of topic and probably one that you would know more about than I would. On the other hand, we want something more general. So we said, well, we're going to, what we're going to do is to look at Western democracy in terms of uh, the context for the future uh, scenarios that Western democracy might have to engage with. And we drew the line there. We didn't get into China and other uh, democracies or uh, regimes that we didn't want to bring into the story. But we had a very general story. And we've continued that in the second. Um, so the first book was called Future Vision. And the second one, which is, a, is, is an article, really, it's, it's, it's a bit shorter, is called The Tomorrow Never Knows Scenarios. We used as an instrument for engaging with people, certainly people of our generation, we used the Beatles uh, and John Lennon as the source of the imaginative framework um, in both books. In terms of the m recent work that we've done, which was uh, completed towards the end of last year, we have focused on not so much Western democracies, but on nation states and asking ourselves, in the context of COVID-19, once we're through COVID-19, how will the, the national borders between countries in the world operate? This is a, a really interesting topic because clearly we can see in terms of what's happening in India today, for example, that the, the way in which national borders are being uh, defined and used is changing dramatically. We have an extraordinary situation where Australian citizens in India seem to be being told that they can't come to their own country uh, from India. And that has to be a breach of, uh, of human rights to, of, in some way or another. But, you know, the governments involved are digging their heels in and saying, at all costs, we want to avoid another spike uh, in COVID in Australia. Uh, Mark McGowan, the Premier of uh, Western Australia, the Labour Premier, said about three weeks ago that he wanted to use the border of WA as an instrument in his government's policy going forward after COVID. But, you know, that, and of course, you know, uh, putting the humorous hat on, I think the sooner that WA secedes from Australia, the better. But uh, we, we won't go into that. No, let's not go into that. <laughs> One of the things that's disappointed me uh, in all of the years we've been working together is actually the lack of impact of the written word. And the obverse of that is that when we've been working uh, in, in workshops in particular, what extraordinary emotions emerge that people all of a sudden actually live into the world they've imagined into being and they don't like it. No, and it, it, that is a, such a good point. People, I remember when we were doing a, a project with a, a major bank in Sydney, uh, we ran a, a, a one day, this is Richard Watson and me, we ran a one day I think, I'm not sure if you were involved in that day, but we ran a one day future sort of uh, course, you know, just to get people thinking about the future before we got into the scenario sort of element for their organization. Uh, and after the first day, I was, we were having a drink. Everyone was a bit exhausted because it had been going on for about sort of eight or nine hours. And I'm talking to somebody who's saying to me, he's a senior exec, said, you know, that was the most amazing day. That's the best use of our time as uh, executives uh, in this particular organization uh, that we could imagine. And behind me was another member of the same organisation who happened to be an accountant, but we won't blame him for that. And he was saying to the person that he was talking to, he said, that was the worst day we have ever spent uh, as an executive team. I can't think of a, another way of wasting more money than we have in the last nine hours. So you get these, these really s significant shifts in response. And one thing that is, I think, eternally true 
is the more agitated and concerned people become as they enjoy the process, the better the process is. It actually wants, we want people to feel uncomfortable about where they are and, and where they're going. I just want to finish up um, with exploring briefly two words that I think I find incredibly important, or the distinction between two words, uh, and that's the difference between possibility and plausibility. Yes, that's a good one. The possibility is that I won't understand your question, but I hope, nevertheless, to give you a plausible answer. <laughs> beautifully put, beautifully put. Anyway, the way this works is this. Um, we are not in business in terms of futures thinking. We're not in business to, to identify alternative futures in terms of which one is the most likely to emerge. And you and I have had clients who actually distort the process by saying that's what they want from, the, from it. The plausibility thing is about logic. It's about having a future that looks as if it makes sense that this is a, a, a reasonable uh, statement about what might happen without, give, without attaching probability to it. So plausibility is really a qualifier of possibilities which are infinite. Yes, absolutely. That's spot on. Oliver, it's been a delight, as always, talking with you, and I sincerely hope that you will come back and we'll talk more in the future. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I've really enjoyed it, as ever. And thank you to all who have been listening to us. Thank you and goodbye.